Um, welcome to our talk, Automation and Configuration Management across hybrid clouds with CloudForms, Satellite 6, and Ansible Tower. You have to move the mouse. Okay. Oh, no, it actually doesn't work at all. Okay, I've got to restart. Try again. Okay, now it works. Okay, thank you. Okay. My name is Laurent Dorm. I'm a cloud solutions architect. I'm based out of New York, and um, I cover pretty much all customers which we have in the Northeast, which somehow are in touch with cloud. That means um, technologies like OpenStack, like OpenShift, Red Hat Virtualization, and of course, um, uh, cloud from Satellite 6 and Ansible Tower as well. My background um, in configuration management goes um, kind of far back in 2006 when I got introduced into Puppet and um, since then basically was in that kind of configuration management and automation space. And my name is Mike Dahlgren, I'm a cloud solution architect up in Minneapolis. And uh, I've covered a lot of strategic accounts in the Midwest and the central region. And I want to apologize to you guys, to you guys first, like I don't want to be between you and supper and beers but we're gonna to try to make this as enjoyable as we can. Don't worry, sorry, guys. Oh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, so today we're gonna to take you on a journey and show you how you can enable your development and application teams to be more efficient, agile, and more productive with tools like configuration management and automation. We're gonna show you as well that when you start using automation and configuration management within your infrastructure or kind of development environments, that you begin to make a mind shift, and this mind shift is very important for an understanding from scale, right? And how you apply configuration management like at scale. And the interesting thing about this is that the mindset which you need in the configuration management space is very similar to the one you need in hybrid clouds, um, which we have and which we are talking about. The other two points which we have is as well, um, why would I use configuration management in hybrid cloud environments? Why does this even make sense? And we're gonna also show um, some demos on how we integrate cloud forms with Satellite 6, cloud forms with Ansible Tower, and um, of course you could also um, do integration across all of them. Everything we show today is out of the box, so there is no customization, which you see as well in the demo. We try to be as um, out of the box as possible. So we all remember when we, when we started out in operations or as admins, the first day we got like this uh, terminal or a laptop and the boss came and said, okay, you have 10 servers, these are the 10 you can manage, uh, you gotta prove yourself first. And we had some tasks which we need to, to create, for example, for Apache Service Manage, HTTP.com, and we wrote the script and worked fine for 10 servers and we were able to manage them. And then in time, like we got access to more and more and more infrastructures, more servers, and we were able to like work with different people, different team members, etc. Now the bigger the environment grew, and this is really kind of also where it started, 2006, 7, 8, was that we began to document what we were actually changing. And the reason why we did that is because at the time, people didn't use configuration management really. And to be able to communicate with peers, the only way really for us to do it across a bigger team was trying to document it. But at the end of the day, also just documenting whatever we tried to change was pretty difficult because you had like knife shifts, you had maybe someone started early in the morning and essentially things got forgotten, right? And where this resulted was pretty much in chaos. And so from an operations point of view, it's really, really difficult kind of to keep track of whatever you're doing across all the systems, but still kind of be fast and be able to provide infrastructure or services to like the application development colleagues. Essentially, with time, it was even more difficult and where it really got to was that you have like your managers and maybe developers who came and said, you know what, you gotta be more agile, too slow. So, 
when we look into the traditional responsibilities most of the time between developers and between operations, is that when you're a developer, most of the time it's like one project where you're concentrated on. You develop maybe an integration into a specific tool or maybe a patch or a, or a security fix. And then once you're done, you have the application, you throw it over the fence, and then operations needs to go and run with it. But from an operations point of view, the actual management of the projects which we have is much different because we are working on multiple projects at the same time. For example, we have business projects which could be like create or work on a trading platform. Then we have internal projects which, for example, could be learn platforms. And um, we have like the plan changes where you go and you patch something and the on-plan changes if the application which the other guys throw over the fence breaks at 2 in the morning and you get a phone call and you have to fix it. So essentially, it's hard for you as, or in operations, to be up 99%, but still keep the agility to make like, development management happy. So how can you kind of get to the stage where you get into that transformation of from being just stable into that more agile and faster way of developing. So I have three kind of main points which we see here. One is openness, merge processes, and organizational change. But if we look at those three words, like it's very important, right? For example, openness. Openness doesn't just mean communication between development and, and, and uh, operations, right? It also means that you understand not just about, okay, I'm creating this web app, but how it works. And, and you need to understand that the more you communicate between teams and the more you understand the big picture, the more from an operations and an application level you can create bigger things. And this is very important if you look at the big picture of hybrid cloud. And then from a merge and process perspective, you might, implemented, you might have implemented different processes, for example, ITIL, a while back, right? And if you look in the cloud space, basically, when you go and test different um, applications and you begin to spin up new instances, you destroy them within like two minutes, it might not make sense to go and create a configuration item in your CMDB every single time you spin it up. The same thing for approval workflows, which might, be ha might have been there for a while, they might not make sense in the technological area you are in today. Right? And so you might have to change and merge certain processes there as well. And then the third point, organizational structure, is really if you want to enable your teams to communicate, you might have to like, merge teams together in terms of application development, operations, um, et cetera, that they, for example, report to same management. Like, that would be a step as well. So what that means is to architect the enterprise for the future, that we need to acknowledge today that change is pretty much the new normal which we have. right? It's constantly changing. And the thing is, if you really want to be successful, then you need to understand the business strategy. And if you have an IT strategy, you need to align it to it. And what we see in, in, my, I mean, in the last three years is that technology moves so fast that if you have a plan, you need to be agile enough to change that plan if technology changes. And you need to make sure that you observe how you and your team operate with it. So you can change um, whatever you need to make it successful. So once we understand what's actually going on and how I can basically enable the teams to get kind of in that new mindset, we need to find the tools, right? Which enables us to do these things. Some of those tools we find in configuration management. Now, since um, we acquired um, Ansible um, a few months ago, um, we now, from a Red Hat point of view, give you the choice of configuration management. Um, so you can use Puppet or you can use Ansible. The interesting thing about both languages, and we see that a little bit later in the, in the next slides, they have a lot of similarities. They seem a little bit different in the beginning. And uh, for example, if you know, we look at Ansible, it does, it's not based on a DSL, a domain specific language, just a YAML file. And it seems very simple when you start out, when you look at that playbook and you're like, oh, it's basically procedural and I can just run it. But essentially it gets more and more complex. 
when you build bigger things. But what this slide actually is saying is that you have different um, communities around it and participation, right? Exactly what we talked about through the whole Congress. And we see we have Puppet Forge and Ansible Galaxy, and those two communities are very important. Why? Because you have over four and a half thousand Puppet modules, for example, in the Forge, where people already try to solve problems for you. The same thing for Galaxy, where you have 6,000 playbooks or different roles where people build already the playbooks for you. You don't have to rebuild them. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's like really, really nice when you start out. You should go and you should look at them. So the tooling which we provide from a Red Hat point of view is Satellite 6 and, and Ansible Tower um, for <coughs> Ansible. When we look at the learning curve usually from a configuration management tool, and that's why I said Puppet and Ansible, if you look at it from that point of view, they are very similar. At the beginning, you look at the language, right? You look at Ansible, you see that YAML file, and essentially you can say, oh wow, that's easy. If I look at Puppet, I need to learn a DSL. So yesterday in the hallway, I talked to, to one of our customers, and he said, oh, we built this um, nice JBoss module. And then I said, oh, wow, that's great. How, how long did it take you? He said, two days. I said, okay, did you use Ansible before? He said, no. I said, oh, that, that's good. And then I, I asked him the question. I said, did you think of maybe adding another data source, changing the port and enabling the admin um, console in JBoss? And he said, oh, no. And that's really where like, that whole kind of chain of configuration management you start out. You do not understand scale, and you do not write the modules as generic as possible, that you're gonna be able to change them in the future because you do not think about the actual use cases. So the longer it gets, and the longer you actually begin to use those tools, the more you begin to reuse modules from a Puppet Forge or from Galaxy, begin to write wrappers around it and understand how you can make use of those like modules and problems which people already solved for you. Then if we go a little bit further, let's say six months in the journey, you really begin to care about collaboration as well. Because the more people you have in your company which can use configuration management tools, the better it is. Right? You're more productive. But you need to be able to share whatever you write, and this is really where source control management comes in, tools like Git. And also automation, which you need to make sure that you have that in place for testing. Now we have um, Nick Strognell. Um, he is a, a principal solution architect in the UK who came up with quite a nice um, workflow on how you test um, RPMs, pop-up modules, um, and uh, kickstarts for Red Hat Satellite. Right? Um, you could do the same for um, Ansible as well, but essentially what happens is this, and this is um, for Satellite 6. So we have a, a build engineer, like, uh, which we see here, and he commits, let's say, a pop-up module into Git. Now, the build job, which we have in Jenkins, pulls like every two minutes, let's say every two minutes, and sees if there was a change in the Git repo. Now, in that case, it detects the change, and what it does is it goes and builds basically the pop-up module which I have and packages it so that it can be afterwards uploaded into satellite. Now, you would think, okay, um, where is the, the validation step here, right? So usually when we do um, validation on pop-up modules or RPMs, we do that previously to the actual commit. So you have a pre-commit hook which does the validation, it parses the module, it does the linting, and for Puppet, for example, we do our spec tests as well. So once the artifact is built, and as said, the artifact could be an RPM and a Puppet module built together, it pushes it to satellite. Now, as soon as it gets pushed to satellite, it gets into a, a library environment. This is the out-of-the-box environment which when you upload kind of a, a, a pop-up module or you create a content view and you publish it and the content view can have RPMs or it can have pop-up modules or it can have both. So once we have that and it's in the library environment, you can even in that build shop say, okay, auto-promote if everything is fine, right? 
or you can promote it yourself, but essentially you can promote. Now once those actual new content, content views are available, you can go and you run an automatic testing um, of the actual uh, proper module which you deployed. And based on the results you get back, you can either go and, and try again, or you know that now you can actually um, push it into production. So you get the tests back. There is a similar workflow as well for um, cloud forms if you write automation. Like they don't have um, enough time to actually show that here, but it's in the references in the back of the slides. So now that we know how to kind of get the configuration management, how to test it, why does configuration management even make sense in cloud environments? Because if you look at cloud environments, AWS, they have their cloud formations, then you have Azure with ARM templates, we have uh, OpenStack with Heat, and then you have Google with the deployment engine uh, or the deployment planner. So essentially you have all those languages, right? But if you think about it, you're gonna have to learn like four or five different languages to basically do the same thing. And, and if you go and you deploy an ELB into AWS and we're gonna take it out one day, how are you gonna change that? And that's really where configuration management comes in. No matter where you go, and no matter where you wanna deploy, it's exactly the same thing. I wanna deploy an HA proxy into Azure, or I wanna deploy an HA proxy into GCE, it's the same module, it doesn't change. Or I wanna deploy it on-prem, it's still the same. So that's very, very powerful and very, very nice and gives you a lot of flexibility which you can have with Ansible or Puppet as well. So the tools which we provide at Red Hat and the main ones in kind of this uh, management realm are satellite cloud forms and, and Ansible Tower. And for those who are not very familiar, I'm just gonna go over it, um, what those tools are. So from a satellite point of view, um, we have from a configuration management um, as configuration management, we, in, we introduced Puppet a while ago. And um, it's also there for the whole lifecycle um, workflow which you use when you promote or build certain um, proper modules or, or RPMs and you promote them to those environments. Then we have um, also, of course, subscription management, which is in satellite since, since ever. And Red Hat Satellite also from a provisioning point of view has a lot of different providers where you can provision into GC, into um, EC2, uh, OpenStack, etc. Then we have Red Hat Cloud Forms, which is our single pane of glass. It really is kind of the umbrella across all our kind of infrastructure products which we have and soon middleware as well. But we're gonna get more into that a little bit later. And Ansible, um, which is very interesting, from a product standpoint or solution standpoint. Um, in the past, it was kind of hard to really do automation um, within the whole suite, but with Ansible, um, it gets a whole lot easier to actually have automation steps and orchestration, um, which we didn't really have before. But essentially, if you look at those tools, like it's really, you wanna have one tool really to rule them all, right? And this is where CloudForms comes in. Cloudforms is really the tool to rule them all. And when I say that, and you look at that next slide, right, it really is. Because the thing is, all the pieces which you, which you see here on, on, on that slide, like we have Ansible, we have Puppet from two, two <coughs> solutions which are supported, but we integrate the Chef, for example, as well. Then you have the whole traditional infrastructure view from like VMware to Hyper-V, you have OpenStack to GCE. Then even if you go, you have like OpenShift in there. But um, I don't wanna to talk too much about that slide, but just to kind of show that it's very extensive and I see everything I have pretty much in my infrastructure. So, platforms and satellite, how does that integration work? And what do we have today? What can we do with it? Platforms has a configuration management provider, um, which currently includes in 4.1, Ansible and Satellite 6. What it shows you out of the box is the bare metal machines or the total configured systems which you have, which is the two there on the, on the right. And um, if you go from there and you wanna build, let's say, a new bare metal machine, 
what you see is that you have a configuration management profile and that profile is basically the host group which you have in satellite. Right? We're going to see later in the demo how that works. And um, from there you can basically build an application if you want to or just do basic config management um, from a system point of view. Now this is kind of a little bit limiting and um, what we did basically is we created a tool which makes you kind of independent on where you are to go back and register to satellite. And this is where like um, Rich Gerido's Bootstrap Pi kind of was born, right? This tool is very, very nice because it enables me to register to a specific satellite server. I can say <coughs> what activation keys I want to use and what host groups I want to register to. Now, in my use case, um, what I needed is I needed basically to register to a satellite server, but I did not build my actual instance in satellite, which came from cloud forms. And I have this in red, so the dash dash unmanaged flag is very important for what I'm going to show you afterwards in the demo, and also if you do cloud deployments. What, what this actually does is it tells satellite to not care in what network you are, in what infrastructure environment you are, if you're cloud or, or on-prem or VMware or Rave, it doesn't care. The only thing it does is it gives you content. So that flag is very important. So yeah, I was thinking about what can I show from a you know, demo perspective and uh, we had this cloud provider, a uh, major one in which uh, had some outages in Australia which had quite a big business impact and made some waves. So what you're going to see um, today is um, basically this. So we're going to have CloudForms, and CloudForms is going to go and do the following. It's going to provision some instances, um, specifically two, into Red Hat Virtualization. It's going to spin up a new instance in Azure, in GCE, and in EC2. Once the instance is up via cloud in it, it's going to go and register to satellite. And satellite is going to give it the personality which it should be. So what we have is we have the database which is on-prem. We have WordPress hosts across GC. We have um, EC2 and, and uh, we have uh, HA proxy in Azure. Now this is not HA of course, but you know we have to make this a little bit better so we're going to deploy um, an HA proxy into GCE as well. So this is really what the demo encloses, but to make it complete, um, of course, what you need is uh, a DNS round robin or band, so which will point to that. So this is really what we're gonna see um, now in the, in the demo. Oh, yeah, so, forgot about that. Um, yeah, so just to show you kind of the, the uh, complexity or kind of the challenges which, which I ran into while building this. Um, so when, you are, when you're building an HA proxy module, right, which needs to be dynamic, you need to somehow be able to feed the information of public IPs across the different clouds. Um, now most of them provide metadata service, so I, I um, queried metadata service and got basically the information I needed in a fact from a public point of view. And um, what this does is it uploads the fact to satellite. Now, the nice thing is that um, some of you might know that we do not have PuppetDB, but essentially we can do the same thing, which you see here. So um, all the way on the bottom here, there is a function um, which is called Foreman. And what this does is it queries the satellite server with a search string, which I have in, in search. And that can really be, I mean, that's just form an API search and it gives me everything back which matches that search, right? And then based on that, what I did is um, I basically added those, the data in, in the ERB template, which is completely dynamic. So if a host goes, this goes away. If a host adds, it, it adds it. Okay. So what we see here is I log in into satellites. Um, we have no hosts, right? We also have no content hosts. And what I did is I created three different host groups, an HA proxy host group, um, a MariaDB, and a WordPress host group. I did the same for the activation keys as well, um, just that it's better understood how it works. And those activation keys are tied to content views. Now, a content view can also have a composite content view, which is aggregated content views, um, which we see here, the, the content view crash summit. And it contains puppet modules and RPMs, right? 
when we look at that, the quantum views, it's the two quantum views, Red Hat and Rail Base, which we have there. To be able to make this demo work, you need to make sure that when you install satellite that the capsules show Puppet and Puppet CA. This is uh, CloudForms, where I'm logging in now, and what I'm gonna show you here is the different providers which are used for that actual demo. So for that demo, it's gonna be Red Hat Virtualization, and we see I have one host installed and two VMs actually within that provider. One of them is the hosted engine, which is the RevM interface where I'm connecting to from CloudForms. Then we also see the cloud providers. I have Amazon EC2, I have Azure, and I have Google Compute. In Azure, I have um, one instance there, which is my template, which I'm gonna use for provisioning, which you see here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and order basically my catalog items which I have so that I can build what, what I showed you before um, in, in that uh, workflow diagram. So we have the HA proxies here you see in, in GCE and the different other applications. Now I chose to, to use different styles basically to show you that you can choose what you want to deploy. But essentially what you could do as well is you could build with like one aggregated catalog item which would order the whole thing. You also don't have to, if you don't want to, to basically go and add host names um, by hand. So you can have easily uh, like a host name method and that's also out of the box where you just add that and it creates the host name in the back end when you actually go and provision, right? And also from kind of an idea point of view, there would also be the ability from a best fit method when you deploy the VMs, instead of choosing statically where they go, that you can write a method based on latency where it would actually deploy those different instances. So what we see now is um, we have it in the shopping cart and we can go and we can order those items. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna hit the automation engine within CloudForms, right? And within CloudForms you have the workflows basically which go. We see here um, that it's in like an approval, like it's pending approval. Um, I'm the admin of this instance, so I approved it, of course. Um, but from that point of view, you see pretty much as a, a normal user and not admin, that in what stages you are. Now we're back in the actual admin console. We see my requests are pending. What we're waiting for now is basically that they go to certain steps in the workflow or state machine and hit basically an active stage. So when we refresh a few times, we see now it got active and what we're waiting for all the way on the right is it actually turns into um, active tree, which means it begins to provision, which we saw down here on the actual Red Hat virtualization console. From the Google Compute console, um, it also starts already from a provisioning point of view. Now remember in the picture we are at step one, where it actually provisions out the VMs. And the same for um, EC2, so uh, in, in uh, Amazon EC2, um, where the VM comes up, it didn't get the host name yet, and the low bounds are 66, which we saw for Microsoft Azure. Now, once the, the VM comes up, like what's gonna happen is it's gonna use basically that bootstrap high script to get back to satellite and register. Now when we look at the VMs now, we're gonna see in satellite when I refresh actually the screens that those VMs now show up, but they didn't run Puppet yet, right? Because it's all gray there, so we see they didn't run it yet, and they're also not running because you would see it as green. So we can go a little bit further and we see um, it's pretty much finished yet. CloudForms already picked up those new instances. It knows the IP addresses, it knows characteristics about the VMs, which we see now here from uh, Red Hat virtualization point of view. So I see now four VMs. I have my, my uh, MariaDB, I have my WordPress instance on-prem, right? And if we go a little bit further to the cloud instances, I now see that I'm gonna have one VM in EC2. I'm gonna have the, the two in, in Azure with the template and the HA proxy and the one in GCE. So, what we see now is I'm gonna to go to the load balancer because I want to have the HA proxy public IP. And um, what we can go and see is if the puppet run actually finished. So if it would be finished, everything is green or, or um, active if uh, blue. And that means it's actually it ran successfully. If it would be an error message or something, it would see it's red. 
So this is the HA proxy stats, um, which we see here. And when we go from, from there, we see that I have a host in, in Amazon, a host in Google Compute as well, and, and my host um, in Red Hat Virtualization. Essentially, um, where we're getting is that I basically have my WordPress application across the whole clouds. Now, if I want to extend this, and that's what we kind of saw in, in uh, that puppet module which I wrote, it really doesn't matter where I deploy. Now, in this case, I'm just going to go and, and order that specific Google Compute HA proxy, which is going to gather the same information as the one which I had in Azure. And if I wanted to, I could also just go and deploy the same HA proxy module in Rev or in OpenStack. Also, it doesn't really like, um, matter from, a, from a, a management standpoint where you, know, you have your satellite server. So in my demo, for example, here I had satellite um, on OpenStack, right? And I had Cloud Forms on Rave. So you're very, very flexible in using the tooling as well. So here we see um, we're already in the active stage of load balance for 33 um, provisioning. I um, speeded up that a little bit because you saw the workflow before. But essentially, um, once it's finished, um, we see that Cloud Forms is going to already pick that up in the clouds. And we're going to see that we have now two um, VMs in Google Compute. And again, I'm going to go and uh, grab the public IP address to kind of compare those two HA proxies, which I have now, meaning in Azure and, and uh, in Google Compute. Now, from a proper point of view, we're going to see um, when we go into satellite now that I already updated basically um, the host field. So now I have six, which is a low balance of 33, and it also ran. And I'm able to go and see the HA proxy starts with the new IP as well, of course. So that means now I have an HA proxy into Azure. I have an HA proxy in Google Compute. And if I would have a low balance, I would be full HA. Um, same notes here as well. And if we go check if I'm actually getting to um, the WordPress host, I see I'm actually getting there. OK. So now you, you pretty much saw you know, what you can do, really, and what the power is around if you put together a, a cloud management platform like CloudForms orchestration, um, which it provides, and you put like a configuration management tool as well, there are pretty much no limits. You can deploy wherever you want, whenever you want, kind of, and whatever application you want, you can do it. And Mike is going to show you now, from an Ansible point of view, like how that integration looks like with CloudForms. Thanks, Laurent. So Laurent really showed us what's possible, and I want to show you kind of like how easily we can do things. So let's move on. As we get started, first question for you. Who here has ever used Ansible? Wow, that's awesome. Who here after this week wants to use it? Oh, come on, raise your hand. There's a couple left. <laughs> but it's awesome. And so I'm going to be honest here. Like, I'll tell you a little secret. When I first heard that Red Hat was buying Ansible, I wasn't excited because in a past life, I was a puppet guy. And I thought, it's like, oh, man, now I have to learn another configuration management system. You know, it's like, how many of these do we need? There's already a plenty of them out there. And now, like, here I am. I'm the biggest fan. And so clearly, a lot's changed in the last year. I got to see what's, what's capable, what's available. And I really want to show you a little bit of secret, like, you know, what we can do with it, especially really easy. And the reason why that is is because Ansible does something that I think is fantastic. It makes simple things simple, and it makes hard things really possible. And I'm going to go off this a little bit, so I'm going to show simple things here today. I'm actually going to show you a few really hard things that we can do simply as well. So that's really cool. Really, though, it's about three main things. And it's going to be about simple, it's about being powerful, and it's about being agentless. And so we mentioned simplicity, but what does that really mean? To me, that means human readable. And I saw this best explained when I was, uh, I was actually presenting at an Azure meetup a couple months ago. And that's a really weird place to be from a Red Hat perspective. I'll just let you know that. Um, talking about Ansible, and at the end of the talk, people were excited, but I was showing like provisioning Azure nodes in the cloud. And the guy that brought me onto this meetup, he said, you have a bug in your code. There's, like this, there's something wrong with your playbook. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, you're missing a field. Like this wouldn't actually connect to the network. There's something missing here. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Like it was optional. I left it out because I was trying to get it to fit in one PowerPoint slide and I was trying to use size 14 font. 
You know, this is not a lot of code. And the fact that he was able to see this, having never seen Ansible before, he looked at me and said, there's something wrong, and he was right, tells you just how readable this is. So if you can read English, you can read Ansible. That's really what this comes down to. The second part about being powerful is interesting because we talk a lot about DevOps. You know, that's all we talk about is DevOps. This is the first tool I've ever seen where the developers love it and the operations people love it. So it's fantastic. Like nobody's really compromising here. Like everybody's automating their own parts. We put them together, now we have a DevOps story that's fantastic. <laughs> Third part, being agentless. This is probably the biggest piece. A couple different things. First off, it uses OpenSSH or WinRM. So it's whatever you're doing today, right? If you have a Linux box, you're probably SSHing in. If you have automating Windows boxes, you're using, probably using PowerShell on WinRM, right? There's no new holes to open up in the firewall. There's not a security thing that we have to worry about. There's no extra agents to keep track of. We don't have to worry about how much memory they're using. Are they patched? Are they pointing back to the right server? None of that applies here. So it's really a fantastic tool for your developers and your operations team for just these reasons. So we talked about cloud forms. Well, there's a lot of confusion where they say, like, these things interact and they overlap. That's not really the case, right? If you want to automate something, you have to do something first. First, you have to know what you have. You have to be able to see it, and if you can see it, then you can automate around it. And so cloud, cloud forms has that visibility. You connect to your providers. It could be your private clouds. It could be your OpenStack and OpenShift. It can be the public cloud providers. It doesn't matter, right? Like, cloud forms ties into these things. Ansible then lets you automate with it easier than writing just plain Ruby. As Lamont said, it also lets you leverage your existing playbooks. So there's thousands of them out there. Use them, right? Nobody wants to reinvent the wheel. Let's uh, reuse what we have that's already there today. One thing I want to note on, everybody seems to be confused about, do I have Ansible built into Cloud Forms or do I need Tower? You absolutely need Tower. The Cloud Forms connects to the Ansible public API inside of Tower. So that's kind of how we do the best of the both. So I'm going to do a couple different things today. First off, I'm going to show you doing Ansible as a service inside of Cloud Forms. And if you guys aren't familiar, a service is essentially anything you would do. So if I want to order a VM, that would be a service. But it could be ordering a WordPress site or just any kind of application that you'd want would be a service. I'm also going to show it from a full automation routine. So like as a state machine, what that looks like there as well. But this isn't too hard. So as a service, it's really two steps. I'm going to set something up in Ansible Tower. I'm going to take my playbook, test it there. I, I don't have to test it, but I will test it because that's how these things go. And then I'm going to attach it to Cloud Forms, and now anybody can run it from Cloud Forms. We give them that functionality. And then finally, I'm going to make it even easier and just add a button inside of Cloud Forms so you have one click and I can get whatever Ansible thing done I want done. Just that easy. So I'm all for making this simple, and I'm going to do the simplest playbook I pretty much can do. This guy is called Update Linux Systems. If you've never seen Ansible before, here's your, here's your opportunity, right? It's pretty straightforward. All we really care about is the very last line. We're calling the yum module, and we're telling it a couple things. We're going to say all the packages, we want you to be the latest version, right? If you're on a Linux host, you're doing a yum update, it's the same thing. This is different because it's actually doing um, consistency checking and error checking and handling, right? You don't have to actually manually update the repos and do these things. It kind of does that for you. So, some of the error checking is already done for you, but we're just saying declaratively, I want all the packages to be up to date. One line in all reality. So once I have that, then I run that inside of Ansible Tower. And the output, if you've never seen it, is pretty much like this. And this is really simple because it's about as simple as we can get. You're going to see gathering facts at the very beginning. It does this by default on everything we run, and it's actually going to pull data back from the host. So host, like data that you can use in your playbooks, like host name, IP addresses, things that you may want to actually automate with. And so it comes back green, it says everything's happy. The second part is, I guess, orange on this screen. Um, it's basically saying things happened. I updated one box, right? So now I have a yum update script that works in Ansible, everybody's happy. Output from, if I did it from a command line, this is what it would look like, same thing, just without the party charts. It says we, had, we gathered facts, we ran something, we changed one host. Easy peasy, right? Nothing's, nothing's too groundbreaking. The nice part now is with Cloud Forms 4.1 that's coming out today, I think, it's uh, all we have to do to plug that in is we say, Ansible Tower is now another provider. We have all these providers, right? You know, Google Compute, Azure, Ans uh, AWS, you know, all these different providers. Ansible Tower is just another one. So we add it as a provider, give it credentials, 
And now when we make a catalog item, all we have to do is, this is how I ask for a new catalog item, and I put in a name, I put in a description, my provider is Ansible Tower, and this is a drop down of all my playbooks that I have in Tower. That's all she wrote. So I just basically selected my demo Ansible environment, grabbed my Linux update server playbook that we, we just showed, and then that's it, a quick order. And this could be anything. But we can even make it easier, right? Um, oh yeah. The other thing that I like to tell, tell people that they don't realize is CloudForms actually has multiple self-service portals. So most people log into CloudForms, they see certain things. There's actually another UI that's for users that's actually stripped down. It's a little bit easier to use. So this is inside the full admin portal, which has all the bells and whistles that we can show as much or as little as we want. But we can also do it from the uh, self-service portal. And we'll see on the left that it's real simple, right? We have dashboards, services, our requests, and our catalog with one item in it. My one item is my updating Linux servers. This is what I would want to show to the users if I don't have everything pre-existing. And you can tell it's a self-service portal because I put in a ridiculously large shopping cart clip art here on the bottom. So all I would do is say the same thing. Now I'm going to add it to the cart, kind of like Laurent was showing you earlier, where we can check out a bunch of these things together, run them all as one batch. Once I run it, here's the output. We can see it from Tower that it ran, but we can also see it from side of Cloud Forms that it ran. So I can see that my state is active. I can see that it was automatically approved, because again, I'm the admin, I get to approve my own stuff, and it's on by default, and it was successful. Now, we talked optional things. Well, that was pretty hard, right? Well, we can actually make it a little bit easier for the users. So now we can actually add optional buttons to call our service items. And so all I have to do is go up to the top, say add a new button on top of my item, and that's it. I give it a name. I can also add custom graphics. I'm a big fan of the Ansible logo. Why don't I put that on that order item? We saw it earlier. That's how we do it. Choose a file, hit upload. And now we got another button. And that's all there is to it. So we can make this thing do anything we want. We saw how simply we can do something. But literally in five to 10 minutes, we can have this set up and, and show this to our users. So they have a, inside of Cloud Forms, they can see you know, their power management, their lifecycle stuff, their, their console and they can run custom uh, Ansible scripts. Why not, right? So we talked a little bit about what this Ansible as a full catalog item was. What the other thing that most people are gonna do is actually use it in part of automation. And so if you're not familiar, CloudForms is by default mostly a state machine. And a state machine is really just a fancy way of saying a whole bunch of steps. So if I wanna build out a VM, it may be 25 steps they get from start to finish. I need IP addresses, I need you know, DNS, I need to have patch manage management, you know, you name it, it's all these steps. Whatever I want to do, that's a smart, uh, smart stack. So we can actually put Ansible in, in those steps. And so with the automation methods that we have, we actually have three new ones. And they're pretty simple, but they're not doing much, right? They're just asking us to call Ansible. So inside of my state machine, I have these guys. I tell it, launch, launch an Ansible job. Wait for it to complete. You know, that's now another step inside of my, my hierarchy. So, end of the day, what does this look like from a CloudForms perspective? User comes in, right? We don't care who or how. They come in there and they hit the self-service portal. Well, we talked about it. There's actually two of them, right? There's CloudForms portal and there's a self-service portal. What's interesting is a lot of people actually don't ever call either one. They put it behind their existing ticketing system. Because if you've taught your users or your, your company like a policy on how to do some action, don't try to make them learn a new wheel again. Tie it right into the current ticketing system. I want a resource. I get a certain thing, and that's all it takes. You can also make your own web portal. You can call APIs. You know, we don't care how you get this request in. We just need to get it in with some values. From there, CloudForms evaluates that, and it does a lot of uh, checking on it, right? Role-based access controls. What can I see? What can I do? Who am I? You know, these are the questions I need to ask, right? Not everybody is allowed to do everything. Next part is in quota enforcement. You know, is there a certain size limit or a, a memory limit? Even a cost limit. You know, what if I give it, once I have rates assigned to everything, let's say I give you $1,000 a month, you do whatever you want, I don't care. Just don't go outside that box, because you can't. It's a nice thing to be able to do for your environment. Uh, approval requirements, like say if I want to order two VMs, that's automatically approved. If I have 10 VMs, I need to get a manager approval. You know, maybe an operations lead that says, you know what, I can't handle that right away, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. And then finally, like workload placement. You know, cost, capacity, et cetera. But even more than that is, you know, we could put it in which cloud provider is cheapest, but what if our machine is determined to be like a PCI issue? 
Well, if it's PCI compliant, now it has to be in this one environment. It has to be segregated. So let the engine decide where things go. That's really important here. Like, don't make it a manual process. Make it an automatic one. And finally, we'll talk about end-of-life policies. And this one always gets missed over. And I don't know why, it, why that is, but it's really important. And it's something that Red Hat actually does really well by eating their own dog food. Because if I want to, let's say, an OpenStack lab or an OpenShift lab or something like that, I can go into the ticketing system, order it. CloudForms does all the work behind the scenes. 15 minutes later, I get an email with login instructions. It says, this is going to live for a week unless you press this button and extend it another week. Right? At the end of the week, I click the button, I get another week. Because I like to think that I'm going to go back and clean up after myself, but I won't. I know I won't. I got enough stuff going on. People always say they will, they won't, right? So how do we get that cycle to automatically take care of the developers and like people that just want to try stuff without making it a permanent mess inside of our environment? And having end of life policies out of the box is a huge part of that. So now that we know what we need, the next step is to build it. And this is where I kind of, I think of like, uh, we have to choose, pick and choose what works best for us, right? So from my standpoint, CloudForms is fantastic if you're dealing with APIs. If you're calling out to something like, like an IPAM or a, you know, DNS, that's perfect, right? Um, creating VMs, adding networking, storage, stuff like that, that's exactly what we want to do. Registering it with a point of truth system, we get API calls. That's fine and dandy. You know, I think of like my toolbox is full of lots of tools besides hammers, even though if I treat them that way. But we can also use it with Ansible. And so in my feeling, the best thing to do with Ansible is to do the post configuration steps. So stuff like update NTP, you know, do the patching like we just showed earlier, just showed how simple and easy that was. <laughs> Creating the user accounts, installing all the agents we don't like dealing with, let Ansible handle it. It does it a lot better than anything else. Applications, policies, like this is really the whole way, but like you design what that path looks like. And it's not even a technical thing either. So technically this is a pretty easy problem. We've got to solve problem. In my experience, the harder problem is actually the business and the policies. And so like, go back, try to whiteboard it. If you can't whiteboard it, you'll never be able to automate it. I promise, it's, it's that bad. And it's interesting if you go through that process, you'll learn a lot of things about like, how much of a mess it really is to get things done. Because most companies are talking weeks, months to provision stuff, and it doesn't have to be that way. So, oh yeah, and I got a couple of things. So I said we got simple things simple, and I can make hard things simple. So this is my favorite top three, but if, uh, I'd love to see uh, anybody else's something. But, Here's some examples, right? I'm, a, I'm an application admin, and I have a whole bunch of like web servers running, let's say, Java. And for whatever reason, I have 80 web servers, and 1% of the time, it doesn't clear out the, the, the cache, and now I have bad data on one of my web servers, and it's causing me trouble. It's kind of a pain in the butt, right? The solution seems to usually be is have junior Linux admin go into production and run rm-fr on the web app route and hope he doesn't clobber it. I've seen it, you know, I've been there. It's not a pretty place. So what you can do in one line of Ansible, you say, these files over here, you're absent, you're gone. Don't worry about it. And now I can put this in tower, I can put this in a button, and I can run this as many times as I want, and it's always safe. I only know what it's gonna do. And preferably, this is part of like a rolling restart script. So we know where we're gonna be. The second one, I don't know about you guys, but I've written the same rsync backup script probably seven times in my career. And every time it was a little bit sketchy, and it always went wrong every once in a while. But I don't know about you, if you've ever done this, but let's say I have a backup that runs every night at 3 a.m. What happens when it doesn't finish in 24 hours? Right? Now you have two of them running at the same time trying to back up the same data. You find out seven days later when the machine's crawling on its knees and you have no backups. And that's usually the time that you find out, like my website's slow and no, no, it's actually not backed up and it's, it's dead. So what you can do is if you call it from Ansible, since it's centralized, you say run this for 20 hours. If it doesn't work, get back to me. That's a fantastic way to do the same exact command, reuse those scripts, but in a better way. The other cool thing about that is my backup scripts would usually do a lot of checking and try to figure out if they they're overwrite another process. But if they failed, they would send me an email. Well, if my server goes funky and goes sideways, I don't get an email. So how do I know something went wrong? Well, if I use Ansible, if it fails, oh, well, something's wrong. I should probably take care of this before uh, you know, weeks go by and I have a, a really difficult conversation with somebody in management. Final one, this one's really generic. I just really want to show off the fact that you can use pipes and greps inside of Ansible in one line. And this is cool, right? It doesn't have to be Apache control, what we're going to hear. But this guy, like Apache control status, grep status, 
is going to return the number of simultaneous connections on that Apache host at any one time. So what I can do is run this against my environment, and if I have 20 Apache servers, what if one of them is getting zero in and out, you know, zero uh, connections a second or zero requests a second? I should probably go look at that, right? There's other fancy tools. We can do this a lot of different ways. This is real quick, dirty, really nice way to take care of it. <coughs> so that's my uh, quick and dirty Ansible tricks and some hard problems for me. But just to summarize what we talked about here. So the real takeaway here is configuration tools are not really like a nice to have. They're like a must have. These really can change the way you do your work and perform like significant time savings. The other part is we have a lot of tools at Red Hat and we don't say like you have to do this, but like again, my toolbox at home is full of lots of tools. I got hammers and screwdrivers galore. You know, use the best tool for the job. Don't just like bang in all the nails. So, or screws. Yeah, and essentially, I mean, if you saw throughout the, the whole talk, uh, if you have so many different possibilities which you have when you put all those tools together, and as I said, everything you saw was pretty much out of the box. That there are pretty much no limits on what you actually can achieve with those, right? 